Welcome to the Flexible Philosophy Podcast, where we sit down with leading thinkers to talk about the ways that their ideas can be put into practice. I'm your host, Hamza King, and on this episode, I'll be discussing the ethics of space exploration with Tony Milligan, senior researcher in the philosophy of ethics at King's College London and author of Nobody Owns the Moon. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy listening. On the 16th of July, 1969, the world held its breath as Apollo 11 launched from Cape Kennedy into outer space. Four days later, an estimated 650 million people watched from their television screens as Commander Neil Armstrong stepped down onto the moon. Armstrong later said, The important achievement of Apollo was demonstrating that humanity is not forever chained to this planet, and our visions go rather further than that, and our opportunities are unlimited. The following year, Gil Scott Heron released a spoken word poem called Whitey on the Moon, where he asked, Was all that money I made last year for Whitey on the Moon? How come there ain't no money here? Hmm, Whitey's on the Moon. You know I just about had my fill of Whitey on the Moon. I think I'll send these doctor bills, air mail special, to Whitey on the Moon. Some consider space exploration to be a symbol of human progress, which has played a key role in our understanding of global warming. Others consider it to be a symbol of global inequality, which has become dominated by ultra-rich elites like Elon Musk. As the ethics of space exploration garners more public attention, academics are racing to construct frameworks which can help guide policymakers and private corporations. One of those academics is Tony Milligan, who is currently working on the Cosmological Visionaries Project, which explores what global initiatives of the future will look like. Tony, it's great to have you on the podcast. Great to be here. Now, before we get into the ethical questions... I think we should kick things off by discussing what the future of space travel will actually look like. So, could you tell me whether it is likely that humans will settle on other planets within the next 100 years or so? Yes, up to a point. We're not going to have massive science fiction style colonies on the moon over the next 100 years unless the pace of events accelerates massively. But what we may well have are small bases on the moon and possibly on Mars. We should certainly have scientific bases in both of these places with a continuous human presence. But a continuous human presence isn't exactly the same as people living their entire lives out in the moon or on Mars. So we are at the beginnings of a process of expansion into the nearby region of space within the solar system, not anywhere else. But how far we get within the next hundred years is is a tough question. If you ask something like Mars even, when will we get to Mars? At the moment, it's looking like that will be in the 2040s, I would say. There was a narrower window towards the end of the 2030s to get those footprints on Mars, but now it's looking like 2040s. I wouldn't expect to be pushed back much beyond that. It is incredible to think that there will probably be human footprints on Mars by 2040. But if large numbers of people will settle on Mars, one presumes that it won't be all laughs and giggles and that there will inevitably be conflict of sort, given the limited resources available to those living on these settlements. So could you explain what type of political systems will evolve and how will they evolve from when we first step foot on Mars to when we have a greater presence a little later down the line? The organisations with the biggest resources are states, and that remains the case. Elon Musk is no competition for the Chinese state. Elon Musk is not competition for the American state. They've got the big resources. So when it comes to the first landings, and the first landings are very different, again, from even rudimentary settlements. At first, we'll go there and we'll come back. So it's not going to be arriving with ready-made habitats or the materials to construct them, and we just go and stay. That seems like a very implausible approach towards any kind of rudimentary settlement on either of these places. Now, because it's states that we're talking about initially, one really expects there to be something like a military command structure and that the initial activities on the moon and on Mars will inherit the command structure of those who go and those who fund the exercise. Now, if that's the US state or if it's the Chinese state, one would expect that the individuals who initially go would be under some sort of set of military responsibilities. Transitioning away from that is a difficult process. And it's very difficult because 
the moon and Mars will kill you in 50 different ways before breakfast and 75 before lunch. So it, these are these are lethal environments. They're adverse environments and adversity leads to a compromising of liberal democratic freedoms that we enjoy down here. So, for example, if we're involved in some terrestrial project, we can walk away from that. We can say, no, I'm not going to do that. And the consequences of that are maybe significant at a personal level, but it doesn't lead to lots of people dying, usually. There are some exceptions to that, emergency services and so on. But if you go to the moon or Mars, you can't really have people saying, okay, I, I'm bored with this. I, let's do something else. Or I don't want to do this anymore. Or, you know, I said that it was going to take on these responsibilities, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something else now. If people engage in those kinds of behaviours, what happens is that people die. So one would expect some degree of compromising of liberal democratic freedoms. And when we transition from books on the moon to very small scale settlements, or say a scientific settlement, a science space, say at the South Lunar Pole or some appropriate place on Mars, to some extent those necessities continue. So if we're thinking about the long term, the coming centuries, like hundreds of years, not just a hundred year, but several hundred years and the possibilities of significant numbers of human beings living elsewhere, say hundreds or even even the both thousands. Once you get to that, you really want to have a transition to enjoying liberal democratic freedoms. And that's a hard transition to it's a hard transition to make. And I suspect the transition itself is a necessary one in two senses. First of all, that we can't just go there and enjoy all the freedoms that we want from day one, for reasons already explained, partly about who's funding it and partly about the risks that are involved and uh, the necessities that those risks impose upon us. But I think a transition is a necessity in a second sense, and that's a sense that concerns the stability of any kind of settlements that we make elsewhere. Because we know from long and harsh human experience that authoritarianism creates its own patterns of dissent. It generates these patterns of dissent. And patterns of dissent in a extremely vulnerable environment, moon, Mars, can lead to disastrous, disastrous things. You don't have some constraints upon the ways in which dissent operates. So you kind of want to avoid generating the most extreme forms of dissent in the first place. And that's the kinds of dissent that you get under conditions of authoritarianism and military rule, where people don't think, well, my way to protest about this is to hold up a banner but rather they think my way to protest this is to shoot someone or to blow something up. If you get to that stage, you really don't want to go there in, in the first place. So the long-term stability of settlements, I think, would be bolstered by a transition to whatever freedoms we can realistically instantiate. And those might not be all the freedoms that we enjoy down here, because we live in a lap of luxury in terms of the, the character of the environment, but it's some transition to the base features of liberal democratic societies. Okay. So when we get there, you're saying there'll be a kind of military style, almost authoritarian form of leadership where... Some elements of that. Elements of that. Yeah, where yeah. people don't necessarily have the resources. So one of the things I found interesting is, for example, there might be limits on oxygen supplies. And then the autocrats who are in control of the oxygen supplies will have such yeah, yeah. yeah it's just extreme levels of control over those living on the spaceships or, or, or on these settlements. It seems unreasonable or at least unlikely to assume that a, a democratic or a liberal democratic system will evolve immediately. But then in the medium to long term, hopefully, the idea is that these systems will evolve because they will allow some kind of stability. They'll prevent people from rebelling and protesting, which could yeah. be especially damaging on these planets. So I wanted to bring in an example here, because you, you mentioned how our ethical frameworks might differ. And uh, I know one of the examples that was talked about is the uh, abortion example. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could explain, if we were, say, to settle on, on Mars, how our attitudes, our ethical attitudes to something like abortion might change. Yeah, this is an example that I came up with a number of years ago. I think it was about 2014, and it's become 
ingrained in a, a lot of discussions. And the problem is this. It's a problem for someone like me, because, you know, I believe in a woman's right to choose, and I, I'm wholeheartedly supportive of abortion rights. The difficulty of taking either that attitude or, say, an anti-abortionist attitude to somewhere like Mars is that we don't really have the choice of doing everything that we would like to and sustaining settlements under conditions of extreme adversity. So, for example, take the problem for someone who is a vehement opponent of abortion. You can have that position and, and that's that's very that's very nice. But, but but the carrying capacity of your infrastructure is limited. You can't just have more humans than the carrying capacity will be able to cope with. And when you are dealing with tens and hundreds of people, even up to the low thousands, you really have to keep a close eye on your population levels. You can't breed beyond your capacity to support the humans, which we kind of, <laughs> we can do that down here. And it takes a very long time for the problems to emerge. But up in Mars, if you, <laughs> if you suddenly start to run out of the material goods and the capacity to feed people, then you're talking about settlement breakdown. And that's a bad thing for everyone. And that's not just about abortion, but it's generally about having a good handle upon the population levels. Now, reverse that and think about someone in my position who supports abortion rights. The difficulty here is, of course, that it's extremely difficult for anyone to get pregnant once you get out of the Earth's atmosphere. We've seen this even at a basic level in tests on the International Space Station. It's kind of easy for fruit flies to get pregnant, but uh, anything above that size, and you, you start to experience various uh, various difficulties. The bodies of animals don't don't kind of like uh, like that. Uh, yeah, I've also got qualms about the experimentation here because I'm a vegan and I don't like animal experimentation, and I certainly don't want that to be taken into space in terms of intrusive biologically intrusive experiments. So the so the difficulty there is that if you want autonomy for a settlement and autonomy for a settlement is crucial, especially if you want to transition to something like an approximation to liberal democratic norms, autonomous settlements are able to reproduce the next generation. So when it becomes tremendously difficult for women to get pregnant and to carry to term, under those circumstances, it could be a social luxury to uh, have anything like the abortion entitlements that I would like to see down here. That's neat to say no abortion entitlements. I think it would probably mean uh, greater constraints and at least for first early generations you probably have some level of consent to the overall process not consent in the moment but consent to the process so that those who go are aware of the of the problem so what kind of abortion rights do you have what kind of constraints on abortion do you have well, the answer to that question probably turns out to be whatever will not lead to settlement collapse. And the ultimate option would be to say, okay, now we realise the problems, now we recognise that there would have to be some compromising of liberal democratic rights. We don't like that. So if the compromising in place A or B or C is going to be too great, then we just don't go to these places. Now, I don't think that works with Mars, but if you think about other places, it might do. So, for example, if the only possibility of having a short-term stable society on a particular planet happened to be an iron skies option, which is, you know, you have some, some version of Nazism in space, if that's the only way that you could actually establish a settlement on that place, then don't go. I mean, really, don't go to places where you have to behave in that kind of way. But it's the grey areas where the compromises to a degree, to an extent, no permanently, and so on, those are the places where the ethical argument really kicks in. One of the things I was surprised to learn when looking into this area a bit is that we've in fact found water on Mars, the moon, on the ice caps. I know you were mentioning earlier. And what we've been talking about up till now has been the ethical obligations we have on this planet and how they might apply in other contexts. And, you know, you're kind of a caution if they can't be applied in the ways we would like, maybe we should be cautious about going. But of course, if there's a chance that there is extraterrestrial life out there, and not necessarily, you know, green aliens with antennas, but single-celled organisms, other things. What type of moral obligations, if any, do you think we might have towards them? Because I suppose this is different in that we might know, for example, that 
going into space would result in an ethical approach to abortion, which is necessary, but which is objectionable. Therefore, we shouldn't go into space, right? But we couldn't say in the same breath, it would be more difficult to say that, well, we know there might be aliens which might have obligations which we might not be able to fulfill. Therefore, we might not want to go into space. So I suppose it gets a bit hazy when you're considering the unknowns. So could you explain what moral obligations would we have towards aliens and why? Why would it be wrong to damage their environments or steal their resources? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in terms of the places that we can go that aren't science fiction, we're talking about the solar system. Beyond that, it's tremendously difficult to engage in interstellar travel. There may be a trick that we're missing, but there's a good chance that we will never engage in that. That the only places that we will ever go to will be within this solar system. And because of that, because there are no green men hidden away somewhere, or greys, or whatever you will, none of that stuff, because the only life that we are likely to encounter is microbial, some people think, well, in that case, it's all ours. We can do what we want with it. And I don't think that's the case. I think that we have ethical obligations in relation to all forms of life. And indeed, sometimes we have ethical obligations in relation to non-living things as well. And that's a hard idea to get around, but I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Suppose we go to Mars and we encounter Olympus Mons, which is the biggest mountain in the solar system, it goes up, up through the, the Martian atmosphere, and there's nothing like it anywhere. So we decide we have a brilliant idea. We start blowing up chunks of it in order to make driveway chips. And we find some economically viable way to bring those back to Earth. Actually, there is no economically viable way to do that, but let's imagine there was. Well, obviously, we've done nothing wrong. Of course you've done something wrong. This is terrible. This is a terrible way to behave in relation to a unique structure. So, so I think that would be a bad thing to do. And I think that um, while it would be difficult for many people to give an explanation of why they think it's a bad thing to do, they might struggle for the particular theory that underpins that. I think the intuition is fairly widespread that you don't blow up unique unique structures. You think about maybe Australia and Uluru, Ayers Rock. It's not just the cultural associations of it. You've got something really unique there and you don't smash it up. Uh, the Blue Canyon in Arizona, really beautiful physical structures. And the, the geoethics, I think, of that are kind of compelling, but you don't smash and damage should behave generally like a vandal and then say, ah, but there's no living things that I'm harming here. Well, really, that's not good enough as a as an answer. I think we've got many, many responsibilities. But of course the responsibilities that we have depend upon the relationships that we have. We have a different set of relationships to inanimate things and uh, to humans. Similarly we have a different relationship to microbial life forms and animals different relationship to non-human animals and other humans. And the ethical obligations and the ethical virtues, duties, and all of those things shift with the, the nature of the relationship. So when I say something like, yes, we still have ethical obligations in relation to life on Mars or anywhere else, even if it turned out to be ever so microbial, I'm not saying that we should say equal rights for microbes and defend their entitlement to send their children to Harvard and Yale. You know, that's that's not a realistic option. Nor am I saying that the language of rights is even the best one in this context. So the difficulty about rights language is that it tends to attach to individuals. I have rights, you have rights. Okay, nations also have rights. That's another thing. But the primary notion of rights is the, the notion of the rights of the individual. And in the case of microbes, unless you are doing some weird or <laughs> some recherche scientific work in a laboratory, you just don't encounter microbes individually. You know, we, we encounter them as colonies and, and as large clusters. So I, I think that there are reasons to protect life. It would be a dumbass thing to do to, to go into the regolith of Mars, corrupt the water supply in ways that, that might lead to the death of a, of a localised a localized cluster of life. And my reasons for saying that are not just because I want to have the life form scientifically examined, that's certainly true, but I think it would just be a generally bad thing to, to do to, to go and to kill off life. 
That doesn't mean to say that there are no circumstances in which you kill any life form. It doesn't mean to say that the life form is, as it were, of equivalent value to a human. Mm. But there are things that we've done in the past, which I think that we shouldn't do. So when, for example, the Viking lander touched down on Mars in the 1970s and tested for life, what it did was it tested a soil sample, then superheated the soil sample and tested it again to see if it got a different signature in terms of the gases that were being emitted. So essentially, it was a test for life, but the way in which the life was tested for was by killing off any potential life and seeing if there was a difference in the before and after picture. Before we've done the killing off action, after we've done the killing off action. Now, as the very first thing that we do on another planet, I think that's a bad idea. (laughs) The first thing you do shouldn't be to try and find an indigenous life form and kill it off. By scorching it. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. It's, it's an ordinary, ordinary, well, it's on in any other way. I think it's it's a bad pattern for yeah. behaviours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. Now I was going to say this kind of it really connects nicely to this idea of the founder effect, right? The idea yeah, that perhaps yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, because we're going to be the first to move there. There's a potential to have a disproportionate impact on future generations, which gives us special moral reasons to be cautious about how we conduct ourselves when travelling through space. But we talked a lot about the conceptual and just to really contextualize a lot of what's going on now then i just wanted to ask what kind of relevant research are we doing in space and by relevant i mean things that can be used to help us tackle other issues now this is a thing that people don't recognize generally but our understanding of global warming here doesn't come from here we didn't get that idea just by looking at us the people who came up with the account what was going on when the data started to come in in the early 1980s, they were people who'd done their research on Venus and on Mars, looking at the atmospheres there. And Venus is very interesting because you have a runaway greenhouse effect. And our understanding of the very idea of the greenhouse effect comes from Venus and from that example. Once upon a time, people thought Venus would be the planet that we go to, not Mars. Carl Sagan thought it would be Venus that we go to. And then we discovered that a uh, that's a good way to get yourself cremated. It's really, really odd. The greenhouse effect there has gone absolutely crazy. And it was people who had done that research who then saw the data for Earth and then said, we know what's going on here. So when it was taken up to Capitol Hill and explained to them and said, there is, I can't remember the particular phrase, it was a 99 percent or 99.9 or 99.5 percent chance that this is human generated these were the numbers that were that were being given out but all of that was on the basis of the venus research and on the mars research even people who are associated strongly with environmentalism like late james lovelock who came up with the idea of of the earth as one giant organism as gaia he's a venus and mars guy that's where he learned his atmospheric signs and where he learned about how atmosphere change over the course of time and how they can be lost and how they can be compromised. Because that's precisely what's happened in the case of Venus and it's what has happened in the case of Mars. For so much of the environment of the atmosphere has been lost. Mars as well, we should remember, has poles. It has ice poles. So <laughs> it's a place where we should be conducting polar science. The priority I think for any kind of humans on Mars, for any stable pattern, is to conduct polar science on Mars. Because we know how much that can feed through into our knowledge. The problem is that there's a time lag. So the Venus and Mars research from the 1960s, we didn't really see how crucial that was to our identification and understanding of global climate change until 20 years later. It took that long for the the feed through to occur. But if we didn't have that, we would be massively behind. I mean, we are behind. We are massively behind. But if we weren't in a position to identify what was going on at that early stage, our situation would be worse than it is. That's fascinating, honestly. I think most people assume that space travel is ipso facto bad for the environment, but the reality is much more complicated than that, given how much of our climate science depends on studying other planets. But on this point about intergenerational issues, one of the concerns that many people have over space travel is that, well, it's not going to be all people who are able to settle on other planets, but rather a select few, the ultra-rich elites, 
who are going to escape the world as it implodes from greenhouse gas emissions and start again on Mars, or so the conspiracy goes. Now this narrative gained traction during the pandemic. I think it dovetailed nicely onto a lot of the COVID conspiracies. So I wanted to ask whether you believe there is any truth behind this conspiracy theory. Are Elon Musk and the likes going to fly off to Mars and leave us all behind? Or is this all nonsense? You know, I used to think it was nonsense. And it's certainly not literally true. And I don't think that there's some deep truth embedded within it. That uh, this is what the elite would like to do, if only they could, something of that sort. I think of it now much more as a, a kind of modern myth. And myths are not exactly descriptions of the world. Myths are the kinds of things that can be deployed and used for various political ends. And so the the idea that somehow, in some weird way, suborbital tourist flights are related to the elites escaping to Mars, when you had that a Richard Branson competition going on to see who could put tourists into suborbit, bring them back down safely again a couple of years ago. This whole idea circulated quite widely that somehow the elite are targeting Mars to escape the consequences of the climate emergency that they more than anyone else have managed to bring about. First of all, I don't think that they have. I think that it's the culmination of a long, a long period of human activity. I mean, if you want to know who's done that, it, it's us. We have done that. It's humans. And we've done it over quite a long period of time. And it'll take a long period of time to get any kind of handle on it. In literal terms, it's not literally true. It can't make any sense because the environmental conditions of living on Mars, if you compare that with living on the Earth in the aftermath of a global nuclear war, then the Earth would be a lovely and welcoming environment compared to Mars. It's really difficult to live on Mars. It's not very welcoming. You'll get to look up at the window and see some beautiful things, to go out and walk around in a spacesuit, not in a shirt sleeves kind of way. But these are really challenging environments. And the people who go there and to establish a human presence will have to give up many things and forgo many things. And their mentality will have to have one of strong sacrifice, not one of, well, as it were, escaping. And uh, how could you take your wealth to Mars? <laughs> it just it doesn't make, doesn't make a, a great deal of, of sense. But when you have a couple of things converging, one is a turnaround in the attitude towards space, because space used to be the thing that people on the left and uh, liberals looked to and people who believe in the future, they all believe in space and they all used to say, look, capitalism won't bring about a space settlement. And this was a long thing, really, from the mid-19th century through to the end of the 1960s, that it, the reason why we're not already on the planets, we don't have an interplanetary civilization, is the limitations of capitalism and the, the people who are only concerned with making profit. And then you get that turnaround in the 1960s when the Apollo program becomes very closely identified with the American military, and then you have Gil Scott Heron in 1970, Flighty on the Moon, which is really a pivotal moment, I think, in the change of attitudes. At that point, suddenly everything flips over and the criticisms of space programs tend to come from the left and progressive voices. When you have that tradition, and that goes on for decades, when you have the populist wave that really struck globally around 2011 and is continuing to ripple through all of these populist ideas about global elites who are in control of things and we want to wrestle control back from the elite and we want to stop the elite from damaging the environment and we want to stop the elite from doing this and that and the other. You have that and at the same time you have this real rapid movement on human activities in space which dates almost exactly to the same time as the beginnings and the emergence of populism. Then you have the recipe for this kind of thing. The people try to understand a process of epochal significance, which is the movement of humans off of the Earth, even to nearby regions of space. A sequence of events of epochal significance get reduced to the latest political fashion, which is some variant of populism. And the odd thing about it all, when we say these things, Elon Musk is in control of the process and the elite are in control of the process, and the elite have damaged the earth, 
and we want to stop the leak from doing what they're doing and we want to wrestle control from them and space programs are compromised by their association with the elite so we don't want anything to do with space programs but one reassuringly tells oneself is that somebody is in control and that somebody is the elite in fact nobody is in control that's not how the system works anymore it's too big it's too cumbersome even the wealthiest individuals Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and people of that sort but they're nothing compared to the state that's what we found in Russia that's what we found in China as well that you know, once they get too big for their boots and they come into conflict with the state we know who wins these people do not have the resources or wealth that states have at their disposal what we're running there is a populist version of the kinds of visions that came out of cyberpunk literature and films from the 1980s onwards in which the company is so big run by an elite at the top of the company and they manipulate the political system and they tell governments what to do and they're in control of the mining process of the world and so on and so forth. That's a really lovely thing to read. It's very exciting, but the world just didn't turn out like that. What we have is a system in which nobody's in charge. Nobody is giving direction to this ship. There's just a multiplicity of players. Some of them are bigger than others, but the reassuring notion that there's a group of people who might go in a room somewhere and take the decisions that chart the direction in which humanity is going, a direction that we agree with or disagree with, I just don't think that's how political systems work. And it's certainly not how space is unfolding. We do not know whether space will make things more egalitarian. We do not know whether space will make things more inegalitarian. Nobody has a blueprint that's going to be followed. Mm. Yeah, no, it's one of the concerns I have with conspiracy theories. They almost imply a structure and order to the world. Yeah. They, 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 <laughs> yes, everything's lined up perfectly. Yeah. So all these people need to do is pull a few strings and we all dance like puppets. It's like, well, I don't know, I don't know if it quite unfolds like that. But just to draw things to a close now, we started off by considering Armstrong's quote and Gil Scott Heron's quote. But I think an interesting aspect of this debate is that they are both, in a sense, true. We have travelled further into space and our opportunities for future space travel are certainly more unlimited than they were in Armstrong's day. But at the same time, we are also seeing the concerns about inequality which Gil Scott Heron raised. In 2021, for example, Jeff Bezos was criticised for spending a fortune on space travel given the long-running complaints about the working conditions at Amazon. So as a final question, in a counterfactual world where instead of investing in space exploration, we invested these resources in addressing poverty, you really focused on that instead. Do you think humanity would be better off than it is now? It's very difficult to say. I think that's what should have happened. And that was a widespread view even within space programs. So when the remnants of the civil rights movement staged protests the night before the Apollo 11 launch, an NASA official called Tom Payne down to the gates to say, look, if you have a way of getting the resources directed away from space to the inner cities then let me know and I will sign on the dotted line to make that happen. The difficulty of course is that we have political systems that are not geared towards doing that kind of thing any more than they are geared towards directing the vastly larger sums of money which go on the military on an annual basis to alleviating poverty. You know the, the money spent on the space programs compared to the, the money spent in the, the military are just it's it's only a, somewhere between it fluctuates like five percent upwards maybe maybe ten ten at the most but like ninety percent of it all goes on the, the other stuff but we kind of targeted the space which is the, the least threatening part I think of that area of expenditure yes we should be prioritizing social concerns but in the counterfactual world that you're describing. If we don't have the information about Mars and we don't have the information about Venus and we just have lots of us better equipped as consumers to continue to consume in the way that we do, then you probably end up with two things. One is accelerated environmental crisis and another one is increased levels of poverty and injustice. Because that's what happens in the course of any kind of environmental crisis, whether it's local or, or global. It tends to disproportionately affect those who are least well off. So, general point, should we direct resources from elsewhere 
to the poorest sections of society? Yes. And I will tick any box for any other concern that will actually get the money shifted from point A to point B. But if people imagine that it's possible to stop space programs at this point, they're deluded. If people imagine that removing money from space programs will go towards the poorest sections of society rather than, for example, to tax cuts for those who are, who are more affluent, if people imagine these things, then I think that they do not understand much about how our political systems actually function. Tony, it's been great having you on the podcast and thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. If you're interested in the deeper philosophical questions around space exploration, subscribe to our newsletter for an extended interview where Tony and I discuss the space economy and the interests of future generations. 